Uh, if you've been with us through the month of October, November, it's uh, Vision Month, and uh, we've been going through a series on the book of Nehemiah. And uh, if you've missed some of those, go and catch them on the YouTube channel. You can catch all the previous messages there. So I'm not going to do any recaps today. Um, but the series on the book of Nehemiah has all been about our vision month and uh, what we believe God has called us to do as a church and as a community. And the book has stretched us and challenged us, but it has not condemned us. All right. And so today I want to talk to you about conflict. Now, how does conflict start? There are many definitions for conflict, but my favorite definition is the one that says almost every conflict arises when reality doesn't meet expectation. Conflict arises when reality doesn't meet expectation. So let me explain that to you. I tell my kids, okay, you can have lunch in your room, but I expect that after lunch, you're going to put your dishes in the sink. When two hours later, I get there and I find dirty dishes on the floor, my reality doesn't meet my expectation. And what happens? There's a conflict, isn't there? In the business that, that I'm involved with, we often go into corporate offices and do work at night or installations at night. And we'll tell the client, Mr. Client, uh, we're going to do this at night not to disrupt your businesses. And when you come in the morning, everything will be sorted. So the client is expecting, if I do an installation on a Tuesday night, that on Wednesday morning when he comes in, everything's going to be fixed. Now, if I haven't communicated to him, Mr. Client, we didn't finish last night. Um, we'll need another evening. He's coming in expecting everything to be perfect. And when he gets there and it's not, when his reality doesn't meet his expectation, there's a conflict. And many of you know exactly what, what I'm talking about in your own businesses and your career paths. There's a conflict email or there's a conflict call, isn't there? For myself personally, I'd planned and I'd expected to give some money to vision offering. But my reality was that my car broke down and needed a major service. And I needed those repair, that money for repairs. That really happened. And so I'm at conflict with what I expected I was going to do versus my reality. And so there's a tension, isn't there? There's an emotion in your heart because you were expecting to do something. I was expecting to do something and now it's not so easy. Your wife, not my wife, your wife expects a game of golf to last six hours, but when her reality is you coming home 12 hours later, then the fight starts. Then you've got a conflict, and there's emotion, and there's tension. You give your spouse your credit card to go buy a small purchase, to make a small purchase, and while you're at home, your cell phone beeps, beep, beep, and when you open it, there's one more zero than you expected. Reality didn't meet your expectation, and now there's a conflict. <laughs> Jews and Palestinians expected to coexist peacefully in Israel between Islamic states. But they were attacked by Hamas in October. And so we have a full-blown conflict. A conflict impacting the entire world. And there's an emotion we feel, a tension that we feel in the air. Jesus himself was not a man unafraid of conflict. Matthew 23, verse 1 to 2 says, Then Jesus said to the crowds and to his disciples, the teachers, to his disciples, the teachers of religious law and the Pharisees are the official interpreters of the law of Moses. So practice and obey whatever they tell you. Great. Imagine those teachers and those Pharisees thinking, yeah, this little boy who spent three days with us in the temple, he's going to justify us. He's going to ratify us. They were expecting him to support them. And then, but that's not how the verse ends. He says, but don't follow their example, for they don't practice what they preach, what they teach. Their expectation didn't meet, their reality didn't meet the expectation of Jesus. And so they were at conflict. And so they tried to kill him from day one. Jesus comes to the temple 
expecting to find the outer sanctuary where cleansing happened to be clean and pure, what did he find? He found it full of merchants. And so his reality didn't meet his expectation, and there was a conflict, and he started throwing over the tables. Satan expects us to do nothing with our faith. But when we stand up for Christian values, when we love and serve others, when we give, that doesn't meet his reality. So we are at conflict with him. When we do what God has called us to do, our reality doesn't meet the devil's expectation. He will try to attack us, to distract us, and to discourage us. So let's look at conflict in terms of the book of Nehemiah that we've been doing. Nehemiah 4, verse 1 to 2. It says, Sanballat was very angry when he learned that they were rebuilding the wall. Satan gets angry when he sees us try to build something, or worse yet, try to rebuild something that's been ordained by God. The devil doesn't like it when you try to rebuild your marriage, the one that was ordained by God. The devil doesn't like it when we try and expand the work of the church that's ordained by God. And so there is a conflict. When we do what God has called us to do, our reality doesn't meet the devil's expectation. Sorry. All right. Carrying on. Sanballat again. He flew into a rage and he mocked the Jews, saying in front of his friends and the Sumerian officers, what does this bunch of poor, feeble Jews think they are doing? The devil will try and tell you that you're too poor, you're too weak to do anything. You're too poor to give to vision offering. You don't have enough. You can't do it. Do they think they can build the wall in a single day just by offering a few sacrifices? Satan will try and make you believe that the sacrifices you make are not enough to make a difference. The sacrifices you make with your children at home, he will try and accuse you that they are not enough. Trying to rebuild your marriage, he will try and tell you that you're not making enough sacrifices. Do they actually think they can make something of stones from a rubbish heap and charred ones at that. He will try and make you believe that what you have in your hands is worthless and that it's not worth rebuilding. He will try and make you believe it has no value. But that's not the truth. So let's see what happens in the story of Nehemiah. Verse 6. At last the wall was completed to half its height around the city for the people had worked with enthusiasm often when we start building something that's the easier part it's called momentum as you start you're happy you're enthusiastic and things start to progress devil doesn't like that verse 7 but when Sanballat and Tobiah and the Arabs Ammonites and Ashdodites heard that the work was going ahead and that the gaps in the wall of Jerusalem were being repaired they were furious they all made plans to come and fight against Jerusalem and to throw us into confusion. See, when our reality doesn't meet Satan's expectation, then he is intimidated. And since he is a bully, he will try to intimidate us and to attack us. So he has the hard question. Why does God allow us to be intimidated or attacked by the enemy when we are building according to his will, when we are doing what he has called us to do? Why does God allow what feels like an attack when you're trying to build your business or your career, or you're trying to rebuild your marriage? Why does God allow the devil to come and intimidate you there? When you're trying to lead your family, why does he come and try and create confusion in that space? When you're trying to grow your faith and we're trying to move the church forward, why does the devil, why does God allow satan to attack us and to intimidate us well because god knows how quickly we build golden calves forgetting him and worshiping ourselves and our own accomplishments 
I really love auto shows, and I watch a, l a lot of auto shows. And uh, many of you all know this show called West Coast Customs. It's owned by a guy named Ryan Friedlinghaus. And he has this tattoo on his fist called Self Made. He loves to show that tattoo off, Self Made. Ryan Friedlinghaus is not self made. He often admits it on other places that 30 years ago when he started, his grandfather gave him $5,000, the equivalent of 100,000 rand, 30 years ago. He's not self made. He's not self-made, but that's what we do. You see, God didn't save Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego from the fire. He saved them in the fire. God didn't save Daniel from the lion's den. He saved him in the lion's den. God is not going to save you from the conflict with the devil. He's going to save you in that conflict. Why? So that you can build your faith muscles and your dependency on him. He's your creator. He's the one who made you. He's the king of kings. He wants to have relationship with you. And when he lets us, if we have our own way, we will always build golden calves to ourselves and we will worship ourselves and say, look what we've done. So God wants us to be dependent on him. Look at what Nehemiah says in verse 9. They're feeling this tension, this emotion of this conflict with Sanballat. Nehemiah says, But we prayed to our God and guarded the city day and night to protect ourselves. They did two practical things. Firstly, they prayed to their God. What does that mean for us? We need to stay in relationship with the king. Our foundations of prayer and Bible reading are non-negotiable. We cannot live our Christian lives not speaking to our Heavenly Father, not connecting with Him through the Word. We need to pray to our God. Did you know that right now, while you sit here, there is a group of people outside on the campus fervently praying for you. They're praying for me speaking. They're praying for our volunteers serving. They're praying for you. They're praying for the person that you may be brought to church today. They don't know their names, but they are praying for them. Why? Because the devil would like to attack this and this not to happen. The devil would like that you don't receive the word, that it falls on shallow soil. But there are people outside praying for you, for us. The second thing they did, they guarded the city. What does that mean for us? They protected what is valuable. We need to protect what is valuable in our lives. Protect your marriage. Gentlemen and ladies, protect your marriage. I heard this quote that said, date your wife or somebody else will. Date your wife or someone else will. Listen, young people who aren't married, you don't date to find a partner and then you just stop. You date to get to know this person and then you have the rest of your life to get to know them more. But you need to date them in marriage. Protect your marriage. Protect your businesses. Don't let corrupt practices fall into your businesses, like not paying taxes and avoiding tax and things like that. Many of you have your own businesses. It's natural that we employ people who aren't necessarily Christians. That's fine. But don't let unbelievers make decisions that impact your business. Only let people you trust with godly wisdom make decisions in your business if you are a Christian. We need to protect the next generation. We need to protect the next generation. I don't know who needs to hear this right now, but your primary school kid does not need a cell phone. Your primary school child does not need a cell phone. I know the times we grew up in were safer. I know that. But the, the, the bad side of a primary school kid having a cell phone far outweighs the benefit of them calling you to say, Mom, practice is running five minutes late. It's very quiet in here, so you don't believe me, okay? I was at an AGM recently at my own school nearby, very good school, when uh, the chairman told us that um, there's currently in South Africa a court case with a father who's suing a bunch of kids because a bunch of boys created a WhatsApp group. They then, one boy called the other boy's mom and name. We're South Africans, we know what they said. And then all the other boys... No one stood up to that. They all put laughy face, smiley face emojis. That father found out 
Now he wants to sue those parents of that children for damages. Your children don't need phones after you've gone to bed. We need to protect them. We need to protect our faith and the church. We need to protect our faith. The, the world is moving to a space that they're saying that church, this gathering, this connection, worshiping together is irrelevant. And if you believe in church, you can sort of watch it online. Online is for catch up or when you're sick or you're on a holiday. That's not church. Um, a recent study done in 2022 called the Talking Jesus Report. Now I'm going to read you some, some stats the stats in South Africa are often not done or they're inaccurate. So this all... Re re <laughs> English bundles running out. Um, this will be regarding some other countries, okay? 2022, 48% of British people consider themselves Christian. 6% describe themselves as practicing. English church attendance has gone down to 4%. This is a nation that sings in their anthem, God save the queen, God save the king. For the first time in Britain's history, they are no longer a majority Christian nation. Less than 48% of the nation is, considers themselves Christian. In America, in the 1700s, remember America was built on Christian foundations and principles. 70 to 80% of people were going to church. This is the country that has on their dollar notes, in God we trust. A st stats show from the Barner Report, in 2010, 18% of millennials, that's my age, are now church attenders. Only 18%. And in 2021, they found that less than 9% of Gen Zs, that's those who are born between 1999 and 2015, those are the ones that never saw 1995 World Cup, right? Those ones. Less than 9% of them attend church, know what church is. We are moving into a post-Christian generation. That's when I'm so excited when I see next generation like Stacy speaking on stage and a worship team leading us in worship. You need to protect your worldview. Now let me remind you what a worldview is. A worldview is the lens which which you look at the world and view what's going on around you in the world. Now, I'm about to pour mustard in somebody's custard this morning, okay? Because what I'm about to say is probably going to shake somebody's foundations. When I heard this, it shook me so, so much that I cannot stop thinking about it currently. I want to tell you this morning that there are only two worldviews. Despite everything that's going on around the world, war, gender confusion, politics, what other religion, other views, other views on my self-worth and my God and my personality and this, and that, I want to tell you that there are only two worldviews. There's a biblical, godly worldview, or there's a man-made worldview. That's it. Everything you see in the world around you can either be viewed through this worldview, the Word of God, which we need to believe as Christians, this is our foundation, or it's a man-made worldview. Things are, people are trying to dilute the Christian worldview. But does it really say, did God really say that? Well, that's what the snake said in the garden. But did God really say that? There are only two worldviews. One, doesn't matter what it looks like, is completely man-made. The other one is the inspired, holy word of God. We need to protect our worldview. Carrying on in verse 10. Then the people of Judah began to complain. The workers are getting tired and there's so much rubble to be moved. We will never be able to build a wall by ourselves. Meanwhile, 
our enemies were saying, before they know what's happening, we will swoop down on them and kill them and end their work. You see, not everything is the devil's fault. While the enemy was working, they got tired. We can't do it in our own strength. You know, we say to ourselves, we won't be able to give to vision this year. That's what happened to me. My wife and I looked at our finances. We, we can't afford to give to vision. No, of course we can't. That would be a completely a move in our own strength. And I had to go back and remember who my God was. And I said, Lord, I want to give to vision offering. Will you give me a seed? And you know what? God gave me a tax rebate. We have to believe that we can trust on our God and the Word of God. Do not get tired of doing good, even if you don't see the fruit. The Israelites were halfway through building the walls, and then they started to get tired. Don't get tired of doing good. Don't get tired of working on your marriage. Don't get tired of disciplining your children. Don't get tired of enforcing godly principles in your workplace or your business. Secondly, don't doubt God's ability in you. No, you can't build it yourself. You can't rebuild that thing yourself. But you can build it with God's help. And you can ask God for help. It's about relationship. We need to be connected to the king. We need to stay in relationship with him. Verse 12 says, The Jews who lived nearby, near the enemy camp, came and told us again and again, they will come from all directions and attack us. So I placed armed guards behind, behind the lowest parts of the walls in the exposed areas. I stationed the people to stand guard by families armed with swords, spears, and bows. Then as I looked over the situation, I called together the nobles and the rest of the people and said to them, Don't be afraid of the enemy. Remember the Lord who is great and glorious and fight for your brothers, your sons, your daughters, your wives, and your homes. When I read this, I see Nehemiah calling the people together, don't be afraid of your enemy. What is he saying? Let's encourage each other. Don't do life alone. Don't go through a conflict sitting on a heap of rubble by yourself. Connect with people. Be part of a life group. Encourage people around you who are going through tough things, who are going through conflicts in their lives. I remember the, the, the recent World Cup final, and uh, Sia went off with that yellow card. And we all know that yellow card was not due, right? And so Sia sat there for 10 minutes, just probably chewing his nails just about, wanting to get back on the field. Because he saw this conflict, this conflict, one person short on the field, the, one of the best teams in the world, New Zealand, be playing. But boy, when he came on, he sprinted back on the field and he started encouraging his guys, telling them, we've still got this. We can do this, but we can do it together. We need to encourage each other. Secondly, Nehemiah says, remember the Lord. We need to stay in relationship with the king. Remember what God has done in the past. Look what God has done in the church. Look what he has done in the past through his people. I had to remind myself, going through this conflict of my finances not being enough to, to give towards vision, that God has never let me down. Every time I've prayed, I know I don't always get the answers I want, but he gives me the right answer. We need to stay in relationship with the king. And then we need to protect what is valuable. Be prepared to fight for what is valuable. But we live in a modern age. We don't fight with the sword. We fight with the sword of the Spirit. Romans 8, 31 to 34 says, What shall we say about such wonderful things as these? If God is for us, who can ever be against us? Since, we did not even, since he did not even spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. Won't he also give us everything else? Who dares accuse us whom God has chosen for his own? No one. For God himself has given us right standing with himself. Who then will condemn us? No one. For Christ Jesus died for us and was raised to life for us, and he is sitting in the place of honor at God's right hand, pleading for us. I know what some of you are thinking. You're like, no, no, but 
Who dares accuse us? Who, who will condemn us? There are people, the devil. The devil will condemn us. He will try and accuse you. That verse says, means who has the right to accuse you? Who has the right to condemn you? No one. If you know the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, no one has the right to accuse you. You're a child of the living God. But we need to know our Bibles. We need to know the Word of God. When Satan came to tempt Jesus on the earth, this is Jesus, the Son of the living God. Jesus could have said to Satan, Futsuk, be gone. He didn't say that. The living God said, it is written. The living God said, the scriptures say. That's how Jesus Christ, the living God on earth, told the devil to go away. We need to fill our hearts with the word of God. It says in Nehemiah, they worked with one hand on the trowel and one hand on the sword. It means they went about their, their, their duty, their job, their calling, what God had called them to do, their jobs, their schools, whatever, but they had one hand on the sword. We need to have one hand on this, and we need it to fill us all the time. There are only two worldviews. It's God's word or it's man's word. There's no other worldviews. Nehemiah 6 verse 1 to 2 says, Sanballat, Tobiah, Geshem the Arab, and the rest of our enemies found out that I had finished rebuilding the wall and that no gaps remained, though we had not yet set up the doors of the gates. So Sanballat and Geshem sent a message asking me, to meet them at one of the villages in the plain of Ono, but I realized they were plotting to harm me. Now, I grew up in an era without Google, you know. <laughs> Google, you, you needed to ask an adult or somebody who knew what was going on. But nowadays we have Google. You can have Google next to you while you read your Bible. I went to ask myself, what is this plain of Ono? And there's only two references to it in the Bible. This is one. It's not really anything of significance. And I want to understand, but why did they call him to the plain of Ono? So I went and Googled, how far is the plain of Ono from Jerusalem? 40 kilometers. Okay, that's interesting. Now I know that Nehemiah, it says in the first part when Nehemiah came, he inspected the ruins on donkey. So I know Nehemiah rode a donkey. So I go and Google, how far can a donkey walk in a day? Get this, donkey can do on average 40 kilometers in a day. In other words, they were trying to create a distraction for him, a three-day distraction. Why? Because it would take him an entire day to go there on the donkey. He'd have to rest, then have the meeting, and then he needed an entire day to go back. So he would have had to sleep over another night and then come back an entire day. They were trying to create a three-day distraction for Nehemiah to not carry on building the walls, to not lead the people. The devil does the same thing with us. He tries to distract us. Here are some ways that the devil tries to distract us. Number one, comfort. Man, I can tell you, for my family and I, it would have been way more comfortable to stay here at North. I stay like 800 meters as the crow flies from here. It would have been way more comfortable. But that's not what God asked us to do. Achievement. How often do we say, no, but look at what I've done. Look at this business I've built. Look at what I've given. I don't need to give more. I've done enough. I don't need to serve anymore. It's one of the ways the devil distracts, distracts us. Entertainment. Oh, my gosh. We spend hours and rands on entertainment. We'll binge watch an entire series on Netflix over a course of a night or a weekend, but we struggle to read this for a few minutes a day. And then we wonder why we're struggling with this conflict. The devil uses entertainment big time to distract us. Denial or rationalization. We can explain anything away. We can explain why we can't tithe. We can explain why we don't have anything for vision. 
We can explain why we believe there's 72 genders or some nonsense. That's a distraction from the devil. Denial. Nehemiah 6 verse 2. I'll read that same verse again. So Sanballat and Geshem sent a message asking me to meet them at one of the villages in the plain of Ono. But I realized they were plotting to harm me. We need to realize the devil's intention is not for you to succeed. The devil's intention is not for you to raise a next generation of godly children in your home that know the word of God. The devil's intention is not for you to rebuild your marriage. The devil's intention is not for us to move this church into other communities. It's, his intention is not for us to make space for more people. That's not his intention. We need to be alert and ready. We need wisdom. We need to have good judgment in our businesses, in our families. What we need is spiritual discernment. Matthew 10 verse 16 says, Jesus says, Look, I'm sending you out as sheep among the wolves. So be as shrewd as snakes and as harmless as doves. You know when the Bible doesn't talk about snakes often, but when it talks about snakes, it's more than often, it's in reference to the devil. Jesus is saying here, be as shrewd as the one who's trying to accuse you and attack you. Be as alert as him, because he looks for every opportunity. He's saying, be awake as what the devil is, but be as harmless as doves. 1 Peter 5 verse 10 says, stay alert. Watch out for our great enemy, the devil. He prowls around like a roaring lion, looking for someone to devour. Satan is at war with God's plans. He will try to bring conflict into your life to distract you and discourage you. He will try and bring conflict into your homes, into the way you raise your children. He will try and bring conflict into the church and into your faith. Lord Jesus, open our spiritual eyes. Open our eyes, Lord Jesus. Why don't you close your eyes with me? I read that, I'm reading that same verse again. Sanballat, Tobiah, Geshem, the Arab, and the rest of our enemies found out that I had finished rebuilding the walls and that no gaps remained, though we had not yet set up the doors in the gates. Can I tell you, sometimes we try and rebuild things by ourselves and we actually get quite far. We do it in our own strength. We try and build businesses. We try and raise our families. We try and live in our community. But I want to tell you that it's of no worth if there's no doors, if there's no gates to what you're building. There's no point if you have no protection. John 10, verse 9 to 10. Jesus says, Yes, I am the gate. Those who come in through me will be saved. They will come and go freely and will find good pastures. For the thief's purpose is to steal and kill and destroy. His purpose is to create conflict. His purpose is he wants to come and accuse you, to condemn you. But Jesus says, my purpose is to give them a rich and satisfying life. But you can only do that when you are in relationship with the king. I want to ask you today, are you in relationship with the King? Do you know the Lord Jesus Christ? Do you know the one worldview that stands for all eternity? There's only one Lord, there's only one Savior, and His name is Jesus. And He wants to be the gate, the door to your life. Man, there's so much stuff going on in the world. I can't imagine my life without knowing that I have the Lord Jesus Christ to be in community with, to live with God. I can't imagine my life without Christian friends who support me and encourage me during tough times, during conflict. I want to ask you today, if you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ, it's not complicated. You can make a decision to follow Him today, and then He will lead you on the next steps for your life. 
If you've never made that decision to choose Jesus Christ, to follow the worldview that matters for all eternity, I want to encourage you, make that decision today. Everybody's eyes are closed. I really just want to pray with you. That's all. I'm not going to do anything funny. And if you'd like to make that decision, won't you just lift up your hand so I know that I'm praying for you. And just show me, Ellen, I want, I want you to pray with me. If there's anybody like that, please raise your hand. I see that hand. I see that hand. I see those two hands. I see that hand there. I see that hand. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Everybody can pray this prayer with me in their hearts. Lord Jesus, I acknowledge I've been trying to build things by myself, but I want you to come and be the gate that leads me to good pastures. I want you to come and give me a rich and satisfying life. Lord, I'm sorry for my sin, and I accept you, Jesus Christ, as Lord and Savior of my life. Father God, help me to shift my eyes onto you. Give me spiritual discernment that I might understand your godly worldview. And Lord, will you lead me every day from here on out. In the mighty name of Jesus, amen.